course. We have three weeks left, right? This is the 13th, 14th, and then 15th. Monday of week 15, which is December 1st, we will not have class. Okay? So no class Monday, December 1st. Um, you can use that time to work on your project. Or you can use it to sleep in so that you're rested to work on your project later in the day. All right? Or you can pick none of the above and do whatever you want. All right. Uh, we really have, <coughs> we have two, <coughs> excuse me, we really have two more main topics to cover. And one of them is tables, which we'll cover pretty thoroughly. And then one is JavaScript, which is more of a introduction to JavaScript. We're not going to get in too great a detail, but uh, it's important to see, at the very least, the role that JavaScript performs on a web page. The three big languages for web pages are HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Um, the bulk of the class is spent on the first two, but to sort of give you a complete picture, it's good for us to at least talk about what JavaScript brings to the table and, and what it does. So, like go ahead. How much like Java is it? The, the syntax is very similar. The, the missing piece, uh, the question was how, how, is, how close is JavaScript to Java? And the answer is, is the syntax of individual statements is, is close. What is vastly different is what is called accessing the DOM, the document object model, where the document object model gives you the ability to change stuff about your page. And so you can point to something on the page and say, I want to make that bigger. You can point to something on the page and say, I want to make that disappear. It turns you into a magician, all right? Where you can, through your code, point to different things on the page and change something about them. And we'll cover this in more detail. Um, but again, you know, we'll, um, the point is, is so that we can understand um, how these things fit together. And then, um, other classes talk about JavaScript in more detail, especially CISS 232, which is uh, scripting in the client-server environment. Tables, though, however, are used to represent a table of data. And that's what we're going to talk about today. When I talk about a table of data, I talk, I'm talking about something that looks like an Excel worksheet. All right? An Excel worksheet you could call a table. It has rows and columns of data. So that's what we mean when we talk about uh, a table. Now, if any of you did any web development in years past, tables were misused. Tables were used because either people didn't want to learn CSS or because Back, going back even further, browser support for CSS was limited. So tables were sort of, people cheated and used them to get a certain layout to their page instead of using CSS positioning like we've learned. If you know what I'm talking about, stop doing it. Stop it. Stop. Right now. All right? If you don't know what I'm talking about, then don't worry about it. Don't, don't pick up that bad habit. All right, forget I said anything. Okay. So, one of the things about HTML that's good in one respect, but when you start talking about laying out a table of the data is confusing, is, a, is the way that HTML treats white space. All right, remember, HTML takes any white space, and by white space I mean an actual space, uh, a, a return, uh, anything like that, and it converts it into uh, simply one character. So it doesn't matter if you have 50 spaces between something or one, it's going to show up as being one. So let's say I wanted to make a schedule. Uh, I wanted to show my class schedule. All right? And we'll say my class schedule looks something like this.
Never mind, I'll do it in Notepad. Let's say my class schedule looks something like this. I have the glare from what? We could, let me turn off the lights. That will probably help a little bit. No, that's not, not at all. There we go. All right. <clears throat> so let's say my schedule looks something like this. <clears throat> Day, time, <clears throat> class, room. So day Monday, time, 9 to 9.50 a.m. Class CISS 216, room BU 105. I'll just do a few of my classes. All right. If I were to go and make an HTML page and simply copy and paste this stuff here. Even though it's nice little formatted here, I think we can see the results are not going to look like this. So let's go in and let's save this as an HTML page. We go and put the basic HTML tags. How is this going to look? Is this going to look like nicely formatted like I see here? No. How is it going to look? All smashed together is a good way to say it. Yeah, it's going to look crappy. Well, Another way to say is it's going to look like just one line going all the way across. Because every white space, uh, every piece of white space, the browser simply makes into one white space. So it doesn't matter if I have an extra line or whatever in between it. It doesn't use that for alignment. And even if it did, that would make it very difficult. Because if the font size was different, the columns could be off and so on and so forth. So the way to represent a table of data where you have rows and columns like this is through the use of the HTML table tags. And there's about four or five main tags that we're going to talk about 
regarding to this. First one is the table tag. So, Sphincters for what? Okay, that's the four main ones. There's also a caption. There's also T head, T body, and T foot. So, yeah, the main ones that you're going to use are those four. And then there's a couple other ones that, that come into play as well. No. You could probably, you could from XML, ex, uh, from XML, from Excel export XM, uh, HTML data, but it's going to create an HTML table. All right? So, and it's also not going to format it in a way that you want, more than likely. The reason you can't embed Excel is you have no idea what the client has on the other end. The client may not have ever heard of Excel. The, the client may be running a Linux machine. There's no Linux in, or Excel on Linux. Or, um, there are some versions of Excel on Mac. Um, so you can't embed anything like that. Um, HTML, JavaScript, and CSS are what are called web standards. All right? What web standards means is that you can count on any system to be able to handle these. You may not handle them perfectly. There could be bugs or whatever. But any sort of device, any sort of system can handle HTML, can handle CSS, can handle JavaScript. If you start getting into other stuff, like for example, the big one that you see on many web pages is Flash. All right? Some browsers just don't handle that. It's not a web standard. And if you were able to do something like that with Excel, the question was, could I bring in an Excel table? If you could embed an Excel t uh, table like you can in a Word document, then that would be something non-standard and, and people that did not have uh, an Excel plug-in or whatever would be out of luck. So no, you, you wouldn't want to do that. Good question, though. Uh, again, you probably could export from XML and just like you can export it to a variety of different formats, you probably could export a, a, a portion of Excel into an HTML document. All right. The table tag goes around the whole table. Tables are comprised of a series of rows. And each row has typically the same number of columns or cells. And that's what forms the column. The table tag goes around the table. The TR tag goes around each row. So in this particular example, I have one, two, three, four, five table rows. So I'll go put in five TR tags. Each one of these consists of four cells. Table cells are either THs or TDs. This is the four tags that you are coming to. There's the table for the main one, there's TR for each row, and then within each row there's typically either THs or TDs. TH stands for table header. It would be like what you'd put on a column header. TD stands for table data. So in this case, the first row would be four THs. All right. And then each one of these would be a row, a table row, that had TDs in it. 
So I'll go in and create TD Monday. So notice how each piece of data gets wrapped in a TD tag. All right. I'm going to go duplicate this and change it so I don't have to retype everything. I'm going to leave this here for a minute, then I'm going to get rid of it. And there we go. And there's our table. And there's the unformatted table. I can now get rid of this. And here we have our table. Now, doesn't necessarily look good. All right, there's probably some things we could do to make it look better, but that is going to fall into what? CSS, right? If we don't like the appearance of something, we're going to change it via CSS. That is a table. It has five rows. The first row is headings. The second row is, uh, the second through fifth row is, has four data cells. How wide did it make the table? Not very? If you were to go and describe it, what would you say? Well, it made it just big enough to fit the data. In other words, how big is each column? Each column is as big as it needs to be. So, for example, the time column is this wide because the widest entry in it is this wide. The class room, all of these are as big as they need to be. All right. Remember, that's the default behavior of a table. How something looks on your page is a combination of the defaults and what CSS you put in there. So if I were to put in here CISS 216 lecture, instead of just leaving it at CISS 216, it'll go and it makes that column wide, wider rather, to fit in that. All right. So, the question of how big it gets to be is it makes the table as big as it needs to be. It makes each column as wide as it needs to be, unless we put some code in there, some CSS code to make it a certain size. All right.
Now, notice a couple other things. Notice that the row with the THs in it look different than the rows with TDs in it. The rows with THs in it, the text is bold and the text is centered. The rows with TDs, the text is left aligned and it's not bold. Again, this is the default behavior. If you want it to look different, you can change it via CSS. Now, most tables that you have are going to have these four tags in it. And there's a, a few other tags that we're going to talk about, but these are the basic tags. Let's spend a little bit of time styling those tags. So I'm going to make a style sheet. And I'm going to say table, and I'm going to give it a color. Give it a background of yellow. All right, so here we have our CSS and HTML files. I do a refresh here, and woohoo! Everything disappeared. Pardon me? No. I do not have an end body tag though and an end HTML it doesn't seem. I don't think that's what's my problem. Let's look again. What do you do when you run into something like this? I don't know. Let's try getting rid of that and saving it. All right, we're back in business. So I know it's something about the style. Try another browser. OK. 
same thing. Wow. Let's show the file extensions and see what the exact name is. All right, it is style.css. That was a good thought. They are both on the desktop. These are all great questions. I have to say, I'm stumped. Oh. Two body. I did have a body in end HTML. All right. Well, I'm going to try this. I'm going to try bringing the style into my... into my page instead of having an external style. And there we go. Something about the way I save that style file is not correct. Anyone watching at home, or maybe the way I created that link, anyone watching this, if you see what I did wrong, shoot me an email. But at any rate, we can see we put a, a, a style with a background of yellow on it, and that's what we have here. Now, this is sort of cramped, because remember, it makes it as big as it needs to. All right? So I can go in, and if I want to make the table wider, I can make the table wider, either by giving an absolute width, 500 pixels, let's say, That spreads it out, makes it a little easier to read. And notice that this is fixed. A lot of students seem to have problems when I talk about fixed versus floating and, and, or flexible. Really, when I talk about fixed, I talk, I'm talking about giving an absolute number, like 500 pixels. Or saying the position is 200 pixels from the top, or 300 from the left. Where it's absolute numbers, where it doesn't matter if you resize the page or not, it's sort of glued down, it's locked down in place. This is sort of a more simple way to do it. For greater flexibility, oftentimes you use relative sizes. So that's what I'm going to do. Instead of making the width 500 pixels, I'm going to make the width 50%. And that means 50% of the available space. In this case, the available space is the whole screen because the table is the only thing on the page. So, I go and view this. And at that, that size of the browser, that's how big it is. If I make the browser bigger, it stretches. Now, notice that it's not going to cut off data. In other words, if I get to where there's not enough room, notice what it does, it drops down stuff 
and sort of makes two lines for it. So it's not going to cut off a word. So you don't have to worry about that. Now, I made it 50% of the page. Note that certain columns are longer than other columns. Room is the narrow column. Class is the big column. What's the biggest and the narrowest? What's the content in it. has the widest content in it. So it sort of sizes them proportionally, if that makes sense. In other words, it doesn't make them all a certain width. The stuff with more data in it, it makes bigger. The stuff with less data in it, it makes smaller. Now again, we can control that if you want. All right. I could say, I want my THs to have a width of 25%. Alright? Now remember, when I say a width of 25%, that's 25% of the available space. So, the table takes up 50% of the whole space. Each column is going to take up 25% of that 50%. So they're all going to be equal in size. If I set, and so notice now all the columns are the same. If I set the size of one cell in the column, the whole column gets that size. And again, it's not going to cut off data. If it needs to, it will go to a second line. Now, I can give impossible instructions to the browser, right? I could say that this is 500 pixels wide, and I want the width of each TH to be 250 pixels. That's impossible, right? The total table can't be 500 pixels if, e if each TH is 250 pixels, because then each TH would add up to 1,000. What happens if you give impossible instructions? The browser takes a shot. It, do, it does what it can, and it comes up with something. In this case, what it does is it makes it to 500 pixels, and it looks and it says, well, you want each of them to be 250. I can't do that, but I can at least make each one of them even. So that's kind of what it does. So, if you give the browser impossible instructions, the browser is smart enough to give it a shot and come up with some answer. Now, the answer isn't, of course, going to be exactly what you specified because what you specified was impossible. All right, back to this. I'll change that back to 50% and 25%. be the same thing if I said each one of these is a hundred percent. Right? I can't make each TH 100% of the whole table. So it tried and it does that. Now one thing that helps and I'm going to do it with a table but it doesn't only relate to the table one of the things that helps is you can put a minimum width on things. For example, a lot of folks had layouts that looked good when the screen was a certain size, but if I made the screen very narrow, stuff would, would overlap with each other. All right, that's sort of a common problem. One pretty easy way to fix that is to put a minimum width on things. So for example, I could say I want each TH to have a width of 25%, but I want a minimum width of, let's say, 100 pixels. 
Again, if I then, if my screen's a thousand pixels wide, each the table will be 500 pixels wide. Each column will be 25% of that, so it will be 125 pixels wide. If, however, I make it smaller, that minimum width is going to kick in. So if I made the browser window 400 pixels wide, the table would take up 50% of that, which would be 200 pixels. Each TH would take up 25% of that, which would be 50 pixels. Well, then the minimum width would kick in and it would make sure it didn't get any bigger than, or any smaller than 100 pixels. So there, notice that there's a little bit of give there. But when I reach a certain point, it doesn't get any smaller than that. All right? And that can be effective because, you know, it's very difficult sometimes to design a layout that's going to look good when the user makes the screen that narrow. Right? But if you put a minimum width in, then that sort of helps you get around that sort of issue. All right. I mentioned by default that THs are centered and bold. And TDs are not centered and not bold. They're left aligned and plain. But I can change that via CSS. So, if I want my THs to be left aligned, and not bold, I can do that. And notice now they work just like, they look just like TDs. Now, you might say to yourself, couldn't I just make them TDs then? And then I wouldn't have to style them? And the answer is no. All right, You don't want to lie to your browser. Though that is not data. Those are headers. Therefore, you should use a th tag. Now, if I want to make ths look like tds, I can do that via CSS. But the correct answer is never to lie to your browser and use a different HTML tag just to get a different look. If you want to get a different look, you use CSS to do that. Now, again, it's a good idea to make your headers look a little bit different All right, than the rest of the data. But you don't have to, um, you don't have to um, make them bold and centered. I could use some other technique. For example, I could make them bigger and a different color. So I could say something like color blue font size One point two am. What's one point two am mean again? It means emphasized one point two times. That means twenty percent bigger than normal. One point two times the normal size. So we go and look at that, and there, notice that. Probably can tell. Maybe not able to, but you can probably tell that that text is blue. Yeah. Yeah, let's try. Let's try making a white background. That will make it more obvious. All right, there it's easier to see that. Could we give the table a yellow background and give the THs a white background? I, I think you know the answer to that. And the answer to that is yes, we can do that. All right? 
not to be unnecessarily optimistic on a Monday morning, but generally speaking, when the question becomes, can we, the answer is yes, we can, right? Can we climb Mount Everest? Yes, we can. Maybe, yeah, maybe difficult, but we can, all right? Can we run a marathon? Yes, we can. People do all kinds of great things, all right? As, as, the, old, as the old saying goes, we've landed a man on the moon. We can d do that. So we can make that. The question then becomes is how to do it. And I, I say this, and I say it sort of joking around, all right? But part of understanding CSS is looking at this and saying, it seems to make sense that I should be able to do that. All right? If you have that confidence in the language in mind that, yes, I should be able to do this, then that sort of is motivating to go and figure out how to do it. All right? So that's why I emphasize almost anything that you can describe and think of, you can figure out a way to do it. How could we do this particular one? How could we make the data of the table be yellow? So this part of it be yellow and this part have a white background. Exactly. I could make the table have a background of yellow. And then make the background of this white. You can do that provided you know how to spell background. All right, so there we go. Now, I want to point out something to you that may be really hard to see. I'm going to change the yellow to red just temporarily because that might make it easier to see. Notice how there's those little gaps between them. That's a quirk of tables. Tables handle borders kind of goofy. The fix for that is to say, not table, border collapse, collapse. And what that does is it gets rid of that little gap between the table cells. So now I'll go and I'll put it back to yellow, or I can make it maybe a nice shade of uh, gray. have that. Now, there's a lot more we can do style-wise with this. All right. We might want to make alternating rows different colors. I don't know if you remember the old old-fashioned computer printout paper. It was called green bar, where you had paper and they were alternating like light green and white bands on the paper. Yeah, you had to tear the sides because it fed through the printer and you had to rip it apart and all that. The idea of that is in the old days, a lot of these printouts were big. They were like maybe so wide. And you'd print out a lot of data going across. It'd be easy for the eye to go up or down a row if you're reading a giant printout like that. 
You know, so like if you're reading across, it's easy for the eye to slip up or slip down. So what they did is those alternating green bars sort of helped keep your eye on the right line, aligned correctly. So we can do something like that here. If the table is wide, it might be easy for, if, there, if the table is wide and there's a lot of data, it might be easy for your eye to move up or down. All right. So we'll look at how we can style that. We'll look at styling it so that we could underline the headers, let's say. Maybe have a line between the headings and that, and so on. We'll also look at some of the other tags and some of the other things that you can do <coughs> to help with accessibility. All right, there are some extra tags, there are some extra attributes, these things that will help with accessibility, along with the other styling. For example, I know CISS 268 means the class that meets Monday at 515. All right, I know that because my eyes can tell this is a column, this is the row. When people can't see, however, they don't have that ability. And just like we can put labels on form fields, we can, put, we can do things with this to sort of tie the heading and the data together. All right? That's what we'll pick up on next time. We'll cover, should be able to wrap tables up, maybe have a few loose ends for next week, but we should have tables wrapped up, and then we can begin investigating JavaScript. Questions? That's true. A a any questions in Ridgeville? Are you okay? Thumbs up. All right. All right. We'll see you next time.